We have, um, in our study, again, just to review very quickly, chapter one, we got a, a glimpse and hopefully changed our view of, again, the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It certainly contains future events, but the focus, in a sense, is not the future events, but Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to begin to look at the seal judgments here, and as we do, the person that will come into view initially is the Antichrist, and uh, it's certainly not our desire to glorify him or make anyone afraid of him, because again, uh, the Lord that we serve is the King of kings and the Lord of the Lord. So revealed to us in chapter 1. Uh, chapter uh, 2 to 3, the seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, things that were going on at that time in the church, things that continue to go on uh, in the churches today, and there were uh, a lot of great lessons for us there. Uh, as we hit chapter 4, we got this view of God the Father uh, in heaven, and then chapter 5, he has a scroll in his hand, and there's John is weeping because it appears that there's no one worthy to take the scroll, but as it says there in verse 9, uh, but you're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you purchased men for God with, uh, with your blood. And, uh, and we talked about uh, Jesus Christ being the Redeemer, being the Savior, always referred to so many times in Revelation as we begin this section to keep in mind as the Lamb of God, uh, again, as John said, who came to take away the sins of the world. I think that's important because because it's Jesus that takes the scroll. It's Jesus that is opening these seals, which in the big picture is the trigger that brings about the coming kingdom. But what it unleashes initially is some very horrific uh, events. Uh, and with that in mind, I think there's a, probably uh, two questions that we need to, uh, to look at. One, one is because you have conflicting views sometimes within uh, Christianity as to the timing of the rapture. Now, we've all along held to, I think, made a case for, and we see it over and over again in Revelation, uh, as we saw a few weeks ago, that the church is already in heaven. We're seeing that song of redemption uh, in heaven. But there are those that would teach that, you know, God's wrath is not really poured out until later in, in the book of Revelation. Yeah, it is a seven-year period. It is divided into two, three-and-a-half-year uh, periods. Uh, you do have the Antichrist, uh, really declaring himself as God and so forth in the newly rebuilt Jewish temple in the middle of that. But really God's wrath is poured out at the end and they make a case for that so the church will actually go through that time period uh, and be here as a witness for Jesus Christ that we might lead others to faith in Christ during this horrific time. But we will then be raptured before the wrath of God is poured out at the end of the tribulation. There are also those that uh, feel like that second half is really the time of God's wrath being poured out. And therefore, the church will go through the first half of the tribulation, but be raptured at that, uh, at that midway point. Uh, and what I want to uh, just show very quickly, and, and we'll see it over and over again, is that right, right from the get-go, God's wrath is being poured out. We're in chapter 6. We'll get to it in detail next week, but look at verse 17. There, John states very clearly, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? God's wrath begins right at the beginning of the tribulation period. And it continues, we could, we could look through and we will in, uh, in coming weeks about the fact that not only during the seal judgments, but again during the trumpet judgments, we'll find statements that this is God's wrath that's being poured out. And then as we get to the bold judgments at the end, we see in uh, chapter 15, verse 1, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels uh, having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So it begins now at the seal judgments. It ends uh, at, the, uh, at the bold judgments at the end. So uh, clearly the church is, uh, as Paul says in, uh, in First, uh, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 9, that God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is removed before the wrath of God is poured out. It's poured out at the beginning. It doesn't clue, conclude to the end. Uh, we're, we're not here during this time, which as we go through the study, you'll begin to be very thankful for. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it begs the second question is in terms of what's God's purpose in the wrath. And I've heard said many times, I've probably said many times, uh, the purpose of this 
time period, the purpose of God's wrath being poured out is, is it's God's wrath against a Christ-rejecting world. And certainly that's, a, uh, I think, a true statement, but the book actually gives us something much more specific than that. Uh, again, we're in chapter 6. Look at verse 10. Uh, these are the tribulation saints who, have, who are beginning to die during this time period. And it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Uh, that's, that's the question. And, uh, and what we find is a response that God is pouring out his wrath against a Christ-rejecting world because they have killed men and women and, and, uh, and children who, are, who have named the name of Christ, who are walking with him. A lot of times people struggle with this issue. If God is loving and holy and righteous and true, why doesn't he do something against the evil in this world? I just read a, 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 another heartbreaking story about the six to eight million young girls, elementary school age in South uh, East Asia, they're sold into sexual slavery every year. We're talking five-year-old and, uh, and up. Of course, there's some wonderful ministries that are rescuing these gals off of the streets out of little cages that they are kept in uh, and giving them a home and introducing to them to Jesus Christ and, uh, and so forth. But it's like, you know, where is God? Well, uh, someday is payday, is the idea. And it happens during this time period. It's the wrath of God because of innocent blood. Uh, look at chapter 16, verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. They're getting what they deserve. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. What he's doing is justified because of what has been done. Chapter 17, verse 6, I saw the woman, this false religious system, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now, in verse uh, 20 of chapter 18, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Uh, chapter uh, 18, verse 24, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Even at the end of chapter 19, when Jesus Christ is coming back to planet earth, there's rejoicing, but, uh, but notice that uh, there's a declaration that his judgments are true and righteous. Uh, verse 1, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God for True and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Now, so as we begin to go through this time, uh, I, you know, again, I don't see the church being here going through this time period, but at the same time, it's a horrific time. Uh, it is God's wrath being poured out and the specific reason God's wrath is being poured out is He's, he's paying back for these horrific things that take place uh, here on planet Earth. But uh, unfortunately, everybody else that remains, that has not come to faith in Jesus Christ, is, is going to go through this, uh, this horrific time as, uh, as well. Now let's look at the introduction to how this all kicks off. It's with the four writers, or what we call the four writers of the apocalypse that we might be familiar with. The first one we say is a deceitful ruler with a crown who will seek peace. Uh, and that's in verses 1 and 2. Now when I saw the lamb, now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and again it's Jesus Christ, he's the lamb of God, he's the one opening the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So the first ruler with a crown appears to be a savior. Why does he appear to be a savior? Hey, he's on a white horse. He's wearing a crown. Isn't that Jesus? Jesus comes in Revelation 19 riding a white horse, wearing a crown. So isn't this Jesus? And uh, I want to say that, uh, and we'll give you a couple of reasons why it's not. 
but it's somebody that comes like him, that appears to be a savior, appears to be a, a Messiah type of a person. Uh, and of course, we're referring to uh, the Antichrist. When we look at Bible prophecy, sometimes it's like putting a, a puzzle together. You know, you get that puzzle and I don't like puzzles, but uh, Kathy does once in a while. You dump that puzzle out there, and, uh, and of course, you try to find the, the borders, the edges, and you get those first, you know, and you're trying to find significant. Now, that's a nose. That is definitely a nose. It's got to go here, and you're looking. You're trying to put this whole thing together. Prophecy is like that, uh, and what Revelation does for us, it, in a sense, it sets the borders, so we can take what Jesus, in this case, said in, in uh, Matthew 24, and what Daniel says uh, in several chapters, and we can kind of now put them together and, and get a fuller picture and understand what's going on. Uh, this ruler uh, has a crown and appears to be a savior. Uh, and we note that uh, first it's a crown that was, that was given to him. And, uh, uh, and he's on a white horse. So he, he comes like Jesus Christ, uh, but he's not Jesus Christ. Therefore, the whole point is there's deception uh, that's uh, that's taking place. When we say antichrist, it means against, but it also means alike or similar to or appearing to be. Uh, again, we would say this is not Jesus because for one, Jesus is the one who opens the seals. Jesus is the lamb already identified for us. He's opening the seal. He's not the first judgment. He's not the writer coming at this point. We also notice that the seal deals specifically with radical judgment and great tragedy that takes place when Jesus Christ comes back to planet earth, it will be with a great celebration to establish his kingdom. And three, the crown is not the same as that in Revelation 19. Jesus Christ will wear a crown that's called a diadem. And, uh, and a diadem means it's a, a, a crown of nobility. The one, you know, the, the kind you get at Burger King. No, that, you know, it's the crown that a, that a king would wear. Whereas uh, this crown is called, uh, uh, in the Greek, it's Stephanos. It's where we get our, our name Stephen or Stephan. If that's your name, means you're, uh, uh, you have a crown. Uh, but this crown is very different. This crown is more like a hakule. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what it's like. In the Greek games, if somebody won, uh, they didn't get gold medals in those days. They would put a, a wreath like a hakule right, right on their head. I don't know if you remember the uh, Olympic Games that were held in, uh, in L.A., and I uh, was, uh, it was like more than a couple of years ago. And I don't even want to guess how long ago that was. But it was very cool. If you're, if you're old enough to remember this, um, I think it was Peter Houston. Who's that? Was it Peter Houston off? Is he the guy that ran the LA Games and did such a fabulous job? Really smart business guy. Okay, I'm getting an amen from Tom on that one. One of the things he did, it was very cool. Instead of just giving them a gold medal, he had some Hawaii connection because he took and had Miley, Miley Lay's wrapped and then dipped in gold. And so every one of them got the, 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 the Stephanos, the crown on their head because they were a victor. Because again, that goes back to the Greek games, but ties Hawaii in it, hey, and it's dipped in, dipped in 24 karat gold on top of it. But uh, that's the idea. These two crowns are very different. So again, even though we've got crowns and white horses, uh, it's, not the, it's not the same person. It's not the same writer. And then fourthly, the writer is given his crown, again, a symbol of authority. And, uh, and we know that this person, this deceiver that will come, he's given authority as well. And Paul tells us about that in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. There he says, the coming of the lawless one, or the same person, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the first seal reveals or opens the door or triggers the, the Antichrist coming on the scene and he comes like a Messiah. He comes with great deception uh, and he is given power from and energized from Satan himself. And, uh, and we have this mention of the idea of the working of Satan all power signs, and notice what kind of wonders they are. They're lying wonders. Uh, appears to be able to do some of the things that Christ did, uh, but uh, there's great deception. Paul says this also in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder. 
For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Uh, the Mormons might be aware of that fact that Satan can transform himself to an angel, appear to be an angel of God. Again, that's where they claim to get their revelation from, is an angel, even though what he said completely contradicts with what God says. Verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness who end will be uh, according to their work. So Paul's point is, and agrees with what's being said here, is that when this person, notice it's a he, the writer is a he, it's a person, when he comes on the scene, he will appear to be a savior, a white horse, wearing a crown, but he will come with the power and the authority given to him by Satan, and he will apparently have the ability, and we'll read more about that later, to perform false miracles and, quote, lying wonders. Now, Jesus warns us about this person says the same thing in Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. There won't be a few that will be deceived. There will be many that will uh, be deceived. We notice that he has a bow in his hand. He sat on military conquest, but no, notice there are no arrows with it. He really comes on the scene as a man of peace. And again, so does this piece of the puzzle fit in terms of everything else we know about the Antichrist? And it does uh, perfectly. In Daniel chapter 7, we're introduced to the, the little horn uh, or the Antichrist, the man of sin, the coming world leader, the coming prince, many names uh, for him. Uh, and uh, Daniel tells us how he comes to power. He'll be little at first, and then he'll, uh, he'll gain power. In Daniel chapter 9, uh, there will be a, uh, he'll be the ruler for the final seven-year period, uh, and he gives us that uh, information in Daniel 9, 27. I realize I'm just kind of throwing this out here pretty quick, and, uh, and we've got the whole study of Daniel online. It's free. You can go get it, listen to it, get the notes, but in particular, chapter 7, chapter 9, and a few others uh, very much pertain to, to the book of Revelation. But he says in verse 27, of the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So Daniel is saying uh, very clearly that uh, there will be one last seven-year period, and all those numbers go perfectly with what we have in the book of Revelation. Jesus in Matthew 24 substantiates that Daniel was a prophet, what he said is going to happen, that Jesus says that this man will come, he'll come with great deception, and he will set himself up in the newly rebuilt Jewish temple uh, in Israel, there in Jerusalem, at a point in time, halfway through the seven-year period, and demand to be worshipped as God. It says he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, he will cause desolation. And uh, future tense for, for Daniel, Jesus comes along and says, it has not happened in the past, though there have been horrible things that have taken place in the temple. The temple's been desecrated before uh, by another uh, Greek conqueror named Antiochus Epiphany, but Jesus says that was not him. This is still yet future, and uh, it's still future for us, but not very far, not very far uh, into the future for us. And I'll give you a little information on that in just a moment. But uh, again, the other key passage for uh, the book of Revelation is Matthew 24. And uh, Jesus tells us lots of information that coincides exactly with our study here. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul called this coming world leader the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the lawless one. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he says, For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he will gradually come to power. Uh, he'll become the dominant leader. And, uh, and certainly we live in a world that we might say has a, a Messiah syndrome. If you go to Israel today uh, and you talk to people on the street, 
uh, and you ask them if they are looking for the Messiah, they will, the majority will say, yes, we need a Messiah, we're looking for the Messiah, but they're not looking for the one in the Bible. They're not looking for the one predicted by prophets. They're looking for anybody that will save them, anybody that will bring peace to the, to the Middle East. That's their big concern. And if you've, you had lived through the kind of terrorism that they've lived through uh, in the last 20 or 25 years, uh, then we'd probably be saying the same thing. There was a point in time where virtually uh, everyone in Israel knew somebody that had been, been killed or harmed or injured by a terrorist, either related to or had a friend or his friend's uncle. I mean, it was, it was so widespread. Uh, they've taken great uh, extreme measures to try to uh, resolve that issue of the uh, the bombs going off, the suicide bombers right in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and other places. Of course, every time they take those actions, they are criticized by the UN and, their, and the rest of the world. I guess they should just let themselves be terrorized uh, in order to make the UN happy. But uh, the UN spends about 80% of its time criticizing Israel. That's not just, a, uh, you know, a, uh, that's statistically. That's, that's what they, they spend most of their time on in terms of actual resolutions that are passed within the, the United Nations. But it's been a horrific time for them. And so they are looking, and the stage is set, again, for a person to come along who is a man of peace, who will establish peace uh, in, in the Middle East. And, of course, you know, that's not talked a lot about on the news, is it? No, it's, it's constant. It's constant. And uh, even this week, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu flew. Uh, you probably maybe have heard by last night that, that uh, he went missing for 12 hours this week, and the... Uh, uh, his, uh, his cabinet said he was at a uh, military base, but uh, they finally admitted uh, yesterday or the night before that he had flown to Moscow to meet with the president of Russia because they are very concerned because of the fact that, uh, that in Iran, uh, Bakhmut Ahmadinejad, they're building their nuclear reactors. They're doing it for the purpose of developing nuclear weapons. They have the missiles, and they said, as soon as we get them, we're going to annihilate uh, Israel. Uh, one of the things that's happening now is they're seeking to purchase from, from Russia an um, anti-missile defense system that our best F-15s, F-16s cannot get through undetected. The only plane that can get through that system is a 22. By the way, we just cut the budget on that, but Russia has these available. We just have to hope that... But there are such good friends. I'm sure it'll never be an issue. Uh, but that's what uh, Netanyahu went to uh, Moscow is saying, do not sell them uh, this system, which, by the way, they've already made some obligation uh, to do that. Israel's uh, had rockets shot again from uh, Hezbollah in the north. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, they are longing for peace. They're longing for a man of peace to come along and settle this issue, and the Antichrist will be able to do this. And he'll be able to do it by a two-state solution, He'll be able to do it. Part of the carrot for Israel, apparently, is they will be able to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount next to the Dome of the Rock. This is known as the Clintonian plan. It was suggested by Bill, Bill Clinton. You've got to figure out ways of bringing everybody together. That was his suggestion, and his plan is still being discussed. I just read about it last week. It's still on the table. It's still one of the viable options. It's one of the things that's being, uh, being pushed for, uh, for today. All that to say is that we're reading about this stuff, and it's not way, way, way future. We're, we're kind of living right in, right in the middle of it. We're not in the tribulation, but I'm just saying the stage is being set for it, and if the rapture's got to take place before it comes, you know, when you go to, when you go to the mall in about uh, four weeks and you start seeing those declarations going up, you can take a pretty good guess that we're getting close to Christmas, and, uh, uh, and that's, that's the idea of looking at the signs of the time that we're in. So the first seal judgment begins with a ruler who is a man of peace. He comes on a white horse. He comes uh, like a savior, but he will be a man clearly of, of deception. Uh, now notice that he comes uh, with a sword to rule uh, in verses 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So this, this ruler 
comes on a fiery red horse, and it's uh, my, uh, my opinion that it's the same person. This whole thing is, uh, is about the Antichrist. The symbolism of fiery red, the other translation could be blood red, and it's a symbolism for the, the war and, uh, and everything that's, that's coming with him. And uh, Jesus, again, Matthew 24, verse 6 says, When you hear of wars and rumors of war, see that you are not troubled, <clears throat> for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation. And that term nation is ethnos, where we get our word ethnic. Jesus says in the end there'll be tremendous ethnic fighting going on in the world. I mean, 10 years ago, were you even familiar with the term ethnic cleansing? I don't think any of us were until like the story we saw there in Bosnia. Now we hear it all the time in Africa, other places. Jesus says at the end, there's going to be a real temptation to be troubled by these things because you're going to hear about ethnic groups fighting against one another and then also kingdoms. So again, uh, uh, larger groups of people of, or nations of what you might want to transfer that. Kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes uh, in various places. So uh, wars, will these things will increase at the end of human history and certainly... Uh, it's, it's happening now, and the horse here that is fiery red uh, will, will bring about it in a greater way. Now, again, his color uh, means death, and certainly that same color is a description of Satan in Revelation 12. We'll get introduced to him as a great fiery red dragon, and I think it just indicates who's behind all of this and who's behind these wars that are going on now and the ones that will come in the future. Uh, the second thing, he comes uh, with peace that will not last. Notice verse 4. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So he comes in with an atmosphere of proclaiming peace, but it doesn't last. It's, uh, he actually comes and actually takes away peace uh, from, from, the, from the earth. Quite a contrast, of course, to the coming of Jesus Christ as opposed to the coming of the Antichrist. The coming of Jesus Christ at his birth in Luke 2.14, the angel saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. But uh, again, many will die during this time period. During the sixth trumpet judgment, uh, we'll see that one third of the population is, uh, is eliminated. Uh, and again, in this text, he's given a great sword, indicating he's going to have uh, tremendous authority and influence, but uh, not only politically, not only economically, but also uh, militarily. So again, when he appears, world peace is ended. Many people are killed, and military powers are placed in the hands of one man. Now again, this follows perfectly with what Daniel said. Daniel talked about the fact that there would be a revived Roman Empire. We used to wonder what that would be like. We don't anymore. It's called the European Union. We, we used to kind of make, well, maybe it'll be called the United States of Europe. Maybe it'll, I've been teaching on this so long, that didn't used to exist. We used to say what we thought it would be, and we don't even have to do that anymore. It's the European Union. Uh, Daniel says there'll be a confederation of the revived Roman uh, Empire, we now know as the European Union, uh, and out of that, eventually, there'll be 10 major power brokers, the kings that will arise. This guy will be one of them, and initially one of them. He will start little, but rise to great power. There'll be a sequence of events, and uh, Daniel says at some point in time, he'll seek to take power, uh, and, and seven of those kings will bow to him, but a few he's going to have to uh, uh, eliminate. Uh, just to kind of give you an update on where, how the European Union is doing on this 10-nation confederation and bringing together their foreign policy, bringing together their economic policy, and bringing together their military might under one leader. Is it possible that they have set up one guy to be in charge of all of these things? Well, it began in 1995, January 1st. The 10-nation alliance did appear in the Western Europe. And uh, they are known as the WEU, or the Western European Union. Uh, then, uh, three years later, December 1998, at their Vienna Senate, uh, they created a new office. It's called the Office of High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy for the European Union. And so that person would direct the 
the foreign policy of the Western European Union, this 10-nation confederation. Uh, the funny thing about that is of 1,150 documents that they uh, wrote and passed that year, this one is called Recommendation 666. What a coincidence. Uh, again, while the person that drafted that and instigated and got this very important position created to direct the foreign policy affairs of the Western European Union, while he was doing that, he was also the Secretary General of NATO at that time, and he made recommendations then that since the fall of the USR, USSR, we should split NATO into a Western and an Eastern, and so they did that. So Western NATO is now uh, headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia, and, um, and the uh, Eastern uh, portion of that is in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, and then it just so happened that he would become uh, in charge of that as well. In October of 1999, when he retired from, uh, from NATO, he became the first person to hold this office, Office of High Representative, directing the foreign affairs of the European Union or the Western European Union. Oh, also he became the Secretary General of the Council uh, of Europe. Oh, he... He also uh, attained a, a, a third pos uh, position and was over the 10-nation Western European Union. So all three positions made him a very powerful world, world uh, player. Now, we've talked about him before. His name is uh, Javier Solano. Uh, we don't see him in the news a lot in the West. He's in the news all the time in Europe. He's in the news all the time in Israel and other places. He is the counterpart for Europe of, like our Secretary of State. When um, Condoleezza Rice, formerly, and now uh, Hillary Clinton, would jump on a private government jet to fly off to meet with foreign diplomats, he'd usually be right in the plane there with her, riding along. He is their counterpart, planning their strategies, working tirelessly try to try to bring a solution to the problems in the, in the Middle East uh, in peace between the, quote, Palestinians and, uh, and the tiny nation of, uh, of Israel. On June 5, 2000, the Western European Union adopted its assembly recommendation of, uh, of 666. The following month, France, one of the 10 WEU nations, took over the EU's six-month rotating presidency, and they immediately began implementing recommendation 666. Uh, and then following that, the decision was made to basically, at that point, as they implemented that recommendation to kind of keep it under wraps and, and keep it secret and so forth, that was voted on and, and passed as well. So I'm not telling you something's going to happen in the future. This, <laughs> this is the other way. This is what's been uh, transpiring over the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, this all fits exactly with what Daniel said, with what the writer is doing, with what Paul warned about and confirmed by Jesus in Matthew 24. Now, again, I, there might be somebody, people saying that, that he is the Antichrist, but most people are not. Most people are just saying that a position has been created now within the structure of the European Union called the Western European Union, where one guy has control over the foreign policy, over the economy, and over the military. One guy. One guy just steps in, and if he chooses to, in a coup, could very easily grasp power of the whole thing. Well, that, that's exactly what Daniel said would happen uh, in the future. Now, to give you the rest of the story, last week in London, Javier Solano had a press conference and now he was retiring. <laughs> so that shot all of, the, all of the prophecy guys down that have been following his career. Now, in that, he said, uh, they asked if he'd still be involved in, in foreign policy and diplomacy. And he says, well, I still got my boots strapped on or something like, made some comment like that. He also made some other comments that were very undiplomatic, that were very much against Israel. Uh, and for the idea of the Palestinians just declaring their own state, trying to move forward on the guise of the uh, United Nations. So he's just somebody we're watching. But the point is, is what Daniel prophesied about the Antichrist, the rider on the white horse who comes in great deception, how he comes to power, the vehicle has been established now. Now again, there was a time when we said, I wonder what it would be like, the United States of Europe. We don't wonder. It's, it's established. Uh, we wonder how someone could come to power over, you know, uh, there's a lot of folks that don't normally get along that well, but they, but they seem to be getting along better these days. But how could someone rise to power without tremendous bloodshed and so forth? Well, the vehicle's in place for uh, this person to be able to do that. 
comes as a man of peace, but he eventually turns very quickly to the fiery red uh, horse that we see secondly, the second seal judgment, uh, and he has a great sword, tremendous military might he'll be able to rule. Third, what follows that, of course, is this ruler cannot control the food supply of the earth. We see that in verses 5 to 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I look, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So his lack of control will bring a, a great famine to planet Earth, which is, is depicted in, uh, in the horse. Black is a picture of famine and starvation. In Lamentations 4, 8, and 9, there they speak of the uh, appearance of famine-stricken people as being, quote, blacker than, than soot. And famine usually follows uh, uh, war and so forth. Notice a couple of things that are going to happen during this time, but according to the symbolism anyway. There will be one, economic uncertainty. Boy, I'm glad we're not living in those days. Huh? There'll be economic uncertainty. There's a scale that's there that's indicating the economy is going to be uh, uncertain. And, it's, and it's, a lot of it's going to be driven by, in this case, well, we're concerned about oil supply. It drives a lot of our economy. It's going to get worse than that, apparently. Uh, it's going to be driven by the actual food supply. The second thing, notice that food prices will rise dramatically. A Roman denarius was a, a normal day's wage. So at that time, a normal day's wage would buy one meal. Of course, if you've got a family, you buy barley. Barley is what is normally fed to animals. So the food supply will, will change uh, dr dr dramatically. Tremendous inflation. Uh, and then three, the quality of the food will change because of that inflation. And then secondly, his, his control does not affect the oil and the wine, which is kind of an interesting statement. There's a, a couple of views. Uh, the predominant view is that the oil and wine are items in the homes of the rich, usually consumed at meals, you know, pleasure and celebration and leisure and so forth. So uh, the oil and wine won't be harmed, so the rich will still be rich. And, uh, and they'll have what they want and what, what they need, but there'll be a great, uh, a great gap between them and and those in the rest of the world. And we, we can kind of see that already. I mean, however, however uh, tough we may feel we have it at times here uh, in the United States uh, and how difficult we have economically, it is nothing compared to what most of the world is going through right now uh, where millions of people are starving and there's just horrific things going on in Africa uh, and some of the other places around the world. Uh, the other view of the oil and the wine is that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum says that uh, in John's days, they were used for medicinal purposes. So it could simply be saying there'll still be uh, medical supply and, and, uh, and those things will be in place, but uh, the food supply itself will be, will be wiped out. Either way, it's not a good situation. Uh, the fourth seal, the fourth point, the consequences of this ruler will be devastating uh, here we see the, the death toll in verse 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So the consequences include a rider, the only rider that is named, and his name is Death. The horse that he is on, pale, means it looks like a corpse. Uh, that's the idea. And then you've got his sidekick with him, whose name is Hades. Hades is the, the place of torment where people go today if they have not come to faith in Jesus Christ, awaiting the great, great throne judgment. So uh, horrific consequences. Secondly, uh, it includes an alarming death toll. He has given power over a fourth of the earth. As of September 4th, 2009, the earth's population has been estimated to be 6.782 billion. That means during this, this time period, about 1.7 billion people will be killed uh, during the, the sealed judgments. Now, there are some commentators that believe that that, that is a, a snapshot of the destruction of the entire tribulation period, uh, and, and that could be... Uh, others believe that, no, this is, it's just the beginning. 
we're still in the sealed judgments. We haven't got to the trumpet judgments where there's another huge number where the earth population is reduced in half again uh, and still the bold judgments uh, after that. In terms of how it will happen, the sword, uh, again, I think speaks of a, a military uh, conquest that will take place, hunger, again, the famine. Death uh, speaks of uh, pestilence, disease. You know, we're just a little bit concerned with the, the spread of uh, disease these days. Uh, and then uh, very interesting beast. So uh, I don't know what it is. Perhaps the fact that the food supply is, is so bad uh, and uh, maybe animals in parts of the world just get way more aggressive than they ever have been before. Uh, but either way, it's, it's a horrific time. So we're only into the, we haven't even got through the, the seal judgments yet. Next week, we'll look at the tribulation martyrs there who have a special place uh, at the altar uh, of God around the throne of God. Uh, and then we, we have a statement that uh, continues that uh, there's a great earthquake and all the islands are removed. That means the Hawaiian islands do not exist. It means every person that lives in Hawaii that does not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will all be killed in the first half of the tribulation with no exception. And uh, I think that's a, a frightening statement. I know this isn't a real encouraging message here this morning, but, uh, you know, and I've kind of been struggling with this thing all week. How do you, how do you end, you know, a message like this? Well, I, it's kind of been my, when I thought about, it's not like I didn't know what was in the book of Revelation. You know, when somebody would say to me, hey, would you teach the book of Revelation? I'd say, have you read it? You know, it's like, you, you want that for a year or however long it takes us to go, go through that? And, um, and yet it's the one book that says, if you read it, there's a blessing in it. Uh, and the blessing is that we went, we went in the end. And uh, there are times when it seems like we're losing here, you know. And we've used the analogy before, you know, would you, would you rather uh, be on a team that, uh, that is winning most of the game and then loses it right at the end? Or would you rather be on, on the team that is behind the whole game? Like USC yesterday, they make that big drive at the end and then win, you know? Which, which team would you rather be on? Well, I think we'd rather be on the team that appears to be losing all along, but in the end we win. But uh, when Paul makes the statement that in Christ we're more than conquerors, it's, it's because we're, we're not going out to conquer hoping that we will win. We, Jesus Christ returns. Um, I think it's also helpful sometimes to know that uh, uh, payday is someday. No, nobody's going to get away with anything. There's a lot of evil in this world, uh, and it's getting worse, and it's getting worse. It's just, it gets tough to watch the news at night sometimes, uh, just the stories that are Horrific things that are that are reported, and uh, and the things that certainly are happening to to Christians around the world. I came across this quote by Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal is the uh, one of the great mathematicians of of all time, uh, and he said this: "The example of noble deaths, such as the Spartans and others, hardly move us, for we do not see what good it is to us. But the example of the deaths of Christian martyrs move us." For they are our members, having a common bond with them, so that their devotion inspires us, not only by their example, but because we should have the same devotion, same example. And then he goes on, he says, the history of the church should be more accurately called the history of truth. <clears throat> and I think, again, as we look at all of this and these events, and we just talk about Bible prophecy and how these things all fit together, the predictive nature and why we can trust scripture, uh, and so forth. Uh, it, it seems like it's intellectual suicide to, to put this book on the side and think it's not relevant to our lives. Uh, I think it, it seems uh, like, you know, how can people ignore the evil that is in the world and think that somehow this is okay and if we just kind of give everybody the right environment and the right education and the right values or something, that is all going to you know, work out in the end, and if everybody's got a, you know, a bottle of Coca-Cola, we can go to a hillside and sing a song and light candles or something, it's all going to be good. I mean, some of the ideas that are out there, you know, this idea that world peace is going to come and so forth, it's just, it's not going to happen until Jesus Christ uh, returns. This idea that, uh, that you can know the, the Creator, have a relationship with Him, have your sins forgiven, have eternal life, and be with Him forever is is door number one, or door number two is, is torment for all eternity. Which would you like to choose? How do people cho choose door two? 
Well, again, Paul says it's the God of this age that has blinded them so they can't see the truth and really comprehend the gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And it's not everything, but certainly part of it is our prayers can help remove that, that blindness. If we get anything out of this, we should be encouraged that we're going to be with the Lord when this is all, all going down. But at the same time, we certainly need to be living for the Lord now and, and interceding for those uh, around us and have a, a realization, even that the early church have, that we're exhorted over and over again to have, to have this realization that we have very few moments and we have very few opportunities to do anything for Jesus Christ. And once that time is up, it's up. And if we kind of live with that thought in our mind, which I think we need to because it's just tough living sometimes, uh, that we need that constant reminder. Well, we're going to get reminded of it quite a few times <laughs> over the next several weeks.
Every beautiful vision, every sweet note, some begins a new creation in the soul. So spiritual. And brimming up into a fountain, an ocean filling, ocean a new life. Flames of true devotion, so.